three women who claim they've been held as slaves in a home in London for at least 30 years have been rescued by the police. They're described as a 69-year-old Malaysian woman, a 57-year-old Irish Age 69-year-old from Malaysia, a 57-year-old from Ireland, and a 30-year-old British woman were all rescued. All three women were highly traumatised and were taken to a place of safety where they remain. We have seen some cases where people have been held for up to 10 years, but we have never seen anything of this magnitude before. Thank you. It's, you know, it's kind of impossible to believe that something like that could happen. Well, I didn't know nothing about it until I read in the papers that he was, like, keeping them as slaves or brainwashing them or what, you know, but I didn't know nothing about it. When I first heard this strange and intriguing story, I wanted to discover how this could have happened right under our noses, in the heart of London. It's only now, three years after the women emerged from captivity, that I've been able to piece together a full account of this extraordinary story. He's God. He rules the world. He's immortal. He's our leader and teacher, and we just have to obey him, otherwise we will die. The first contact with the women was made by a charity who rescued them from a flat in Brixton in South London. We got there about 11.05, because there was a window of opportunity when the people were in the house. And sure enough, these women all came out at uh, exactly 11.15 sharp. Coming up in the car, somebody wanted to know why the cars coming towards us had white lights... That was Aisha. ..and the cars in front of us had red lights. Do you want to know why that was? In the immediate aftermath, None of the agencies involved knew what they were dealing with. So the women were spirited away to Leeds, where they could be protected from the press and the public. Yvonne Hall and Gerard Stocks run an organisation helping people who've been trafficked and enslaved. They took the three women under their own roof and were the first to realise the full extent of what had taken place. The 69-year-old Malaysian woman, seen here on the left, is Aisha. The 57-year-old Irish woman, on the right, is Josie. And the 30-year-old is Katie. When she first came, yeah, she was 30 years old in, in the way we measure mm. age, but she wasn't. Mm. She was much probably nearer to 10 or 11 or something like that. And again, I'm not a psychologist, but I think I think that would be accurate mm. from what other people are. I, 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 I would even go even further. I would say she was 10 or 11 in her ability to communicate verbally, but in her ability to actually um, do practical daily tasks. I'd probably drop it back down to maybe six stroke seven. It became clear that Katie had been born in captivity and had never known any other life. She had never been to school and had only rarely left the house. After much delicate discussion, Katie finally agreed to an interview. Did you ever go to the dentist or the doctor? No, not allowed. And why was... why was that? I guess it... I guess he didn't want anybody to know of my existence, that was part of it. But he also used to say that... he used to say NHS means never help self. So we should... if we get ill, we have to focus on him and then we'll get better, as if by magic.
Good evening and welcome to the BBC's News at Six. The couple suspected of holding three women as slaves for more than 30 years have been named as Aravind and Bala Krishnan and his wife Chanda. The BBC understands that both were leading figures in a far-left communist faction based in Brixton in South London in the 1970s. Up in Leeds, the women began to talk about life in what they termed the collective. They referred to Balakrishnan as Comrade Bala, or AB, and revealed that he had had control over every aspect of their lives. He had threatened and terrified them, claiming to have an invisible, all-powerful machine at his disposal, which he called Jackie. Tell me about Jackie. What does Jackie stand for? Jehovah, Allah, Christ, Krishna and immortal Iswara. And what was Jackie? Is Bala's mind control machine. Who can who controls everything in nature and everything in the world. And what would he say that Jackie would do to you if you did the wrong thing or stood up to him or or kill you or cause you terrible harm. Jackie came up a lot um, with all three, all three people. Um, and even now, I would suggest that two of the three absolutely are definitely very scared of Jackie, that Jackie's going to take revenge at some point. They leaflets about Comrade Bala, yeah. Despite having voluntarily left the collective, Josie Herival has spent the last three years on a one-woman mission to clear Balakrishnan's name. Thank you very much. Are you and others also fighting? Are you part of the campaign with other people as well? Absolutely. We, we, we're so in solidarity with all the people who are suffering under the British state, you know. US-led British state. It's a slave of America. Britain is a slave of America. And how is Comrade Bala? No, no, I'm not being interviewed, OK? I don't want to be interviewed. OK. She declined to take part in this film, declaring the BBC a tool of the British fascist state. In the one interview she gave to Channel 4 News in 2015, she gave her view of Jackie. What I understand about it is it's, it's a machine, you know, electronic machine which helps people to do good, you know. But he has talked so, about people dying as a result of that machine. Yes. Do you believe that? I do, yes. That he had the power to make somebody die? Yes. With Jackie's help, Balakrishnan controlled the world from inside the flat. He took credit for all global events, including wars and natural disasters. Everything that happened outside, like earthquakes and hurricanes, he claimed was a consequence of a lack of discipline or misbehaviour by his followers inside. We asked that Space Shuttle Challenger, it was meant to have blown up when he said that people were challenging him in the house. And the, the shape was like a Y when the shuttle blew up, it was like a why. So he used to say it's because people are vying with him. So there's a why there, like that, in the sky. <laughs> the collective lived at numerous addresses in South London over the 40 years of its existence. At one address, a pizza delivery boy rang their bell by mistake. So Bala said that this was the fascist state trying to provoke him. What, by bringing the pizza? Yes, yeah, so by bringing the pizza and d disturbing him and disturbing 
what he was doing. So, so the, then the same day there was an earthquake in Kobe in Japan, which meant that Kobe means God's door. That's what he said. So he said when there was a knock on God's door. Crazy, but yes. Go on, finish that thought. So when there was a knock on God's, God's door, door, then there was this huge earthquake in Kobe to punish the fascist state for the fact that the pizza delivery man came to to God's door. Bala's door. Bala's door. When I was asking her about some of the strange theories that Bala Krishnan she had. Laughed. She laughed. Yeah, she would have done. It's not because she thinks it's funny, it's because she's really embarrassed or really pressured. And it's a really important thing to know when, if you're asking the questions. Yeah. It, uh, it is, isn't it, really? Because yeah. a lot of people will see the laugh and think, oh, she's, you know, she thinks it's funny, whereas really she's, a, she's in distress at that point. Using Jackie as his tool, what was his plan? To, to become the ruler of the world? Yes, or he used to say to become the overt ruler of the world. He said he was already the ruler of the world, but then he has to become overt, that's what he used to say. So he was the covert ruler of yes. the world at this point, yep. inside the flat. Yep. And, and, he, and he was going to become the overt ruler. Yes. And how was that going to happen? What was going to happen that suddenly would mean that the whole world would obey him? He never exactly said. He was going to take over the universe after the world, and to see if she could eventually take over the world, I believe the country that we mentioned were Brazil. She was going to get Brazil as a starter to see if she could control that, OK? So, I know. <laughs> So that she was being primed for ruler of Brazil. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Why Brazil? I've absolutely no idea. Does she know? Does she, had she been? Does she know much about Brazil? Don't know. Don't think so. began in 1976, when Balakrishnan founded his Maoist collective. The Workers' Institute of Marxism-Leninism Mao Zedong Thought was on Acre Lane in Brixton in South London. His group included his Tanzanian wife Chanda, her disabled sister and about 15 core followers, most of whom, like him, were students from Asia. One of them, Aisha Wahab, has never spoken to the media before. She had come from Malaysia at the age of 24 to study quantity surveying. I, I, I was really inspired by him, you know, and I, I thought he, he was great, you know, to have been able to you know, clarify our minds as to what to do with our lives, really. It's really Were you happy living in the collective, Aisha? Uh, yes, I thought every day was very interesting. I, I was never, ever bored. There's always something new to, to learn. There's something new to do. I mean, everything was... I just c c can't imagine I would have uh, had a better life than that. Also in the group were two middle-class British women, Josie, who was studying music when she met Balakrishnan, and Sean Davis a postgraduate student at the London School of Economics. I was particularly intrigued by Sean's story. How did you know Sean? 
I, I was at school with her. And what school was it? Uh, it was Cheltenham Ladies College. She was academic. I think she was quite profoundly academic in a funny way. It wasn't necessarily the type of academia that passed exams at a very high level at that stage, but she was a deep thinker. Oh, well, we used to see them down in the marketplace. We used to have our paper sales there, and other groups did as well. As I said, it's a bit of a crowded market. And these guys would turn up. They didn't have a paper to sell, but they used to hand out uh, uh, leaflets. And we used to collect them because, well, they were sort of like the comic relief. And we'd pop down the pub afterwards for a pint, and we'd just roar with laughter at what the Workers' Institute had to say. The Communist Party of China and Chairman Mao are on the verge of launching the final offensive this year to dismantle the old world of colonialism, imperialism and hegemonism and build the new world of socialism. And then, in emphasis, eternal glory to our great leader and teacher, Chairman Mao Zedong. Uphold proletarian internationalism. There we are. I have one specific memory of her, which is probably the last time I saw her. I can't be sure of that, but I think it probably was when she invited me for dinner. She had her boyfriend, Martin, there, and she was dressed in dressed like a Maoist with all, you know, the blue and the collar and, and the whole dinner. We had the, Ma the Chinese communist radio playing and she, she talked to me. Well, the way she talked to me, I didn't know who she was. She had become a communist in the way she was talking to me. She, she, there was nothing of her coming through at all by this stage, that's what I would say. I, I, it was quite scary. Um, I didn't like being there. It was too late. I wanted. I had to stay the night. She didn't want to give me a bed because I wasn't a communist. Um, but I got a mattress eventually. And I'm afraid the next morning I just ran away. One of the things that's interesting is that the Workers' Institute was uh, probably unique among the groups of the far left in that they didn't see themselves as being uh, in the business of creating a revolution. Uh, they saw their role as preparing the population in the imperialist heartlands, as they refer referred to Brixton, London, Britain, uh, for liberation by the Chinese. Did they put set a date when the Chinese Liberation Army were going to do this? End of 1977. And so uh, very early in 1978, I had a conversation with several of the, the members at the time, expressed my disappointment that I had not been liberated from uh, uh, capitalist oppression uh, as they had predicted. And they said that the computer satellites got so good that actually um, the Chinese do already control everything in the world, but they realize that you can't hand people socialism on a plate. They need to learn to struggle for themselves. So they have actually taken over everything, but they're leaving the appearance of capitalism in place so that people can actually have this experience of liberating themselves. The idea was that the Chinese Red Army would come and liberate the UK within a year. That's what um, Balor expected. Yes. You remember that? Yes. So you're waiting for that to happen? Yes, that's what <laughs> it didn't happen. <laughs> it didn't happen, did it? Yes.
I came across Aravind and Barakrishnan in the mid-70s. It was my formative years as a police officer. I was a, a uniformed police officer in Brixton. And it really was an age of lots happening. There was anti-capitalist marches. The whole environment was like a, a cauldron of uh, demonstration. And in amongst all of that, appeared in these premises here in Acre Lane what was called the Chairman Mao Memorial Centre. <laughs> and this was quite intriguing even for those days and I decided to pay them a visit one day. And I said to Balakrishnan, I'm going to be watching you <laughs> and I'll be looking out every time I come by what you're doing in here. The Workers' Institute were raided. That was very, very rare. We were all surprised, considering these guys had no presence anywhere and were only just like a nuisance to the authorities on a non-political nature. We, the police, got a warrant, and it's very telling we got that warrant under the Misuse of Drugs Act because, you know, our belief was these people were on some form of drugs and the place was raided by police. Uh, no drugs were found, and it, it was boarded up and closed down. And while their view is going to be, yes, this is the capitalist state closing us down, well, I'm sorry, sometimes it needs a hard hand. Well, we call it trump up charge. You see, the charge was about uh, having uh, drugs having and holding drugs and consuming drugs as well. So none of us even smoke cigarettes, so we don't know anything about drugs. This, this was seen as persecution, and as I understand it, that's when Balakrishnan then uh, re withdrew into uh, a much more, almost a hermetic kind of environment with just the very, very small uh, group of mostly female acolytes. People would just say every so often, whatever happened to the Workers' Institute? Because they'd suddenly disappeared, because they'd always be there on the corner at Brixton, and then they suddenly disappeared. And now we know what happened, they went underground. Or what was left of them. By 1980, the collective was living in hiding and consisted of Balakrishnan, his wife and her sister, and seven other women, including Shan, Josie and Aisha. I want to be immortal Like a god in the sky I want to be... Exploiting their isolation from the world, Balakrishnan indoctrinated them with increasingly strange ideas. Was it your understanding that he was immortal? Well, he did, he did say that and he did repeat it again and again. And um, he also showed how it was possible for him to be immortal. How did he show that? Well, uh, you know, different things. For example, he never believes in going to the dentist because he said we should let the teeth drop naturally. Hello again. Hello. And then by the time you're 100 years, the teeth will regrow. Hi, I'm Dr. Hare. Pleased to meet you. Hi. Thank Would you, you like to have a seat? Yes. Please. And then you have another set of teeth. And then when those drop, you'll regrow again. Well, yeah, I just wanted to uh, okay, talk to you about okay, your teeth. Okay. You see, you've lost uh, quite a number of teeth, you know, over over the years. We lose teeth. We wait until the teeth, is, the tooth is grown again. It, yes. Until the tooth grows on its own. Yes, it will grow on its own when we are hundred or over years. It will grow back on its own. Yes. Have you oh. ever heard of that? Have you ever heard of teeth growing uh, back? No. <laughs> 
No. Well, I have heard of it. Right. It does happen. Right. Yeah. But I don't know if I'm going to be even 100 years old so. Yeah, yeah. You see, <laughs> sometimes it's better to keep what you have That's rather right. than wait for... No, no, I, yeah. I, I don't lose my teeth on purpose. No, 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 no. I, I know, but, I know. What, what I was told is that let the teeth fall by itself, you who, know, who? and then it will grow up again. Sure. Who, who said this to you? Oh, somebody I know. Somebody you know, yeah. right. I suppose, again, you know, from the outside, it does sound like you were brainwashed. What's your response to that, Aisha? I think it, the question of brainwash, I quite agree. I think the, 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 the line that we were given is that we do need to be... Our brains did need to be washed. Because it was, you know, it was... Um, dirty or, you know, mucky or whatever, had to be washed of all ideas. When you, buy, you bring, you want to build a new world, we can't bring the old, you know, into it. So we have to chip away the old and in place, you can't leave it blank. We have to fill the void. In 1983, Balakrishnan's socialist programme took a new and sinister direction. He began an experiment which he called Project Prem. When Katie was born, did you know who the father of the baby was? No. I did ask Sean, I said, because at first, when she was pregnant, we didn't know she was pregnant. Well, I didn't anyway. So I said, Sean, you know, are you pregnant? Because her, her tummy was going because She said, no, it's not. I said, why is your, your body like this? So she said, you know, Abby said some people do have it like this. There's gas in the body and, and you know, gets bigger and bigger. So that's it. And when Katie was born, I, I was really shocked. Do you think Sean believed that? Did she know she was pregnant? Maybe she didn't, I don't know. Maybe she didn't either, you know? So that must have been a real surprise. Yes. When, so she just had a big tummy for whatever strange reason, and then suddenly a baby arrived. That's right, yes. I think he used to say that I was a product of electronic warfare. His mind control machine, Jackie, was meant to have got Sean pregnant, I suppose. Tell me what name you were given at birth, Katie. Prem Malpinjusi. The first name Prem is in Asian language. It means meant to mean love and the second name is, I think it's for Swahili, it means revolution. So it meant love revolution and I hated that. As your name was actually an instruction. Yes. It was like, you must love revolution. Yes. <laughs> and he thought that when he rules the world, that I'm meant to be like a soldier for him or his mouthpiece. Project Prem was an experiment in child rearing, intended to eliminate the nuclear family. Comrade Prem, as Katie was known, was dressed in genderless clothing, was never told who her parents were, and was raised collectively by the group. It's a new way of looking after a baby is not done before. I'm so used to babies being held and cuddled and carried and things like that. We were discouraged from doing those things because I wasn't really clear exactly what what the correct lines were, but. It, it meant to um, 
You see, the baby meant to be solid, without any encumbrances from anywhere else, you see. So he just meant to stand by him herself. I suppose that was the idea, you know, that when you hold somebody or caress somebody, there's a bond, bonding going on, you know. There's a bond between baby and mother. But there wasn't that encouraged in Katie. He was the only one who was, was meant to cuddle me and no one else was meant to because if I was to cuddle other people, he used to say that that's being like being a lesbian, to cuddle other women. When Katie was born, there were plenty of things I had to question. And this was one of them, about treatment of Katie, disciplining of her. And, and there was a discipline on me as well. There was once when Katie wet herself, and she was only four, and, you know, she was denounced, and I was denounced as well for letting her wet her. And I was so angry about it. I really felt like running out of the house at that time, but I didn't. I tried hard not to because then I could see that if I had gone out, I had nobody outside. I lost contact with my family, I had no money, I had no job, and I might have been deported. That was strange. If you see them on the street, even shopping, they never say hello. They just go straight in, out, yeah. If I'm in the garden, they're upstairs. If they see anyone out, the people. If you look up, they close the curtain, so you don't actually see who's looking. Did, what, did you think they were unusual neighbours? I think they were just refugees. <laughs> and lived there. They thought they were hiding from somebody, never speak. But one looked like, she looked like English. But the others looked like Chinese or Filipino or whatever. But, but one, she's tall and the rest short. The garden was overgrown. It must have been three, four foot all the time since then people left. And it was the same with the front of the house. He would never cut anything. He would always tie the stuff back, just enough to get a wheelchair in and out. And the whole garden was covered in weeds. Curtains were never opened at any time at all, front or back of house. The only time you'd see them was sometimes at the back when the little girl would she would turn around and pop the head up, pop back down again. Is it disturbing to you, Peter, to think that there was a child being held captive next door? I mean, as I'm talking to yourself now, it's actually bringing a lump to the throat. <laughs> what aspect of it is upsetting for you, Peter? It's just the thought of what that child has gone through. At the time, I just didn't do anything about it. I mean, and I'm so sorry that I did. Again, I didn't know what was happening, but if I did, I definitely would have done something about it. One night, 1996, there was screaming in the middle of the night. And subsequently, I learned that Sean had tried to stab herself with a knife. And then, on the early morning of Christmas Eve, again there was screaming and shouting in the middle of the night. So I went downstairs with Aisha, who I was sleeping with, and found Sean's. Sean was lying on the floor, and she had been tied up. Her hands and legs were tied, and she was gagged. And she had this piece of cloth in her mouth. I don't know whether it was a sock or something, I don't know. And O and Josie were both holding her down on the floor and they had tied her up. And Bala was sh and Chanda were both shouting at her. She had tried to run out, that's why she was tied up. So you think she was trying to leave or trying to yeah, escape? Yeah, she was trying to escape. And then, because she couldn't escape that way, that's why she 
she went out through the window thinking she could escape that way. She had lost her mind by that time. AB said that, you know, uh, you know, that she fell. She, he, he started from the beginning to say that she fell, you know, because of the nature of the bathroom. So I just stuck to that. Having fallen from the bathroom window, Sean was taken to hospital, where she fell into a coma and died seven months later. There was an inquest after Sean's death. And at that inquest, you were asked whether she had any children. Yes. And you said no. No. Yes. Why was that your response? Because AP said to do so. Because we definitely didn't want Katie to be taken away and then live a life as of old, you know, and not participate to build a new society. At the time of the inquest, a journalist visited the collective and had an exchange on the doorstep with Josie, Aisha and a third woman, O Kareng, who was also from Malaysia. When you come, when the milkman comes, you're part of the fascist state. Could we speak to Comrade Barlow? You're part of the fascist state, and if you don't stop harassing us, we we'll call the open fascist state on you. Could we speak to Comrade Barlow, please? We don't want to talk to you. Are, are, just... you higher, are you higher than the communist court? Everything has been sorted out We would just like there. to ask you very simple questions. You are just why showing won't you speak that you are part of the fascist state. Josephine, why won't you speak to you us, please? You are showing us that. We don't want to talk. Please, would you... We could we speak to, to Comrade you... Barlow, please? Sean died when Katie was only 14. After she died, um, did life get better or worse for you? Life got better for me in a funny way. I mean, because she was one of the worst, like, servants of, of Bala. So it was such a relief with her not there. Because his sort of worst kind of enforcer had gone. Yes, his worst enforcer had gone, yes. Life may have improved, but the unbearable tyranny of Project Prem continued. He used to say that everything would go against me if I had done wrong. So, like, possibly the like the light shouldn't work or the tap shouldn't work because everything is controlled by him, by Jackie, his mind control machine. So, like if I went to the bathroom and turned the tap on, it shouldn't work because I had done wrong. But then when I went to the bathroom and the tap did work, I thought, oh, the tap, you're on my side, thank you. And then I kissed the tap and hugged the toilet when the flush worked. I used to look forward to the clocks changing when they used to go forward in March or go backwards in October because that made things a bit different, get darker or lighter in the evenings. In 2004, Comrade O, who had been with Balakrishnan since the 70s, had an accident in the kitchen. I think she banged her head and she she collapsed and and she was shouting, call the doctor. Bala and Chanda kept harassing her as she was 
collapsing and she was ill and kept saying talking 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 to her and trying to force her to answer questions and she couldn't answer because she was she was dying really and then they start saying to her stop throwing a tantrum nobody bangs their head and refuses to talk and things like that but she was actually in unable to to talk because she was she had a stroke and then the next day she died by now two comrades had died and three other women who had been with the group since the 1970s had chosen to leave the collective had dwindled to just six Balakrishnan, his wife Chanda, her sister and Katie, and only two remaining followers, Josie and Aisha. Josie and Aisha were required to do all the housework. And the collective depended financially on Chanda's carer's allowance and her sister's disability benefit. Balakrishnan continued to frighten the few remaining members of the household into staying. He also used to say that if I defied him and just wanted to go out on my own, then either there would be the lightning would strike me dead or blow up, as it called spontaneous human combustion. So you that you would spontaneously combust? Yes. Or explode. Mm. To me, that idea that someone would spontaneously combust if they left their flat is complete nonsense to me, with my world view. Now that you're out and living your own life, can you see that that sounds like nonsense? Well, it... it I, I can see that it can be non nonsensical, but th there is such a thing as spontaneous human combustion. I've read about it in, in two, three different places, so I have an open mind about that. But as to whether AB can induce it as and when he wants, that's the different issue. In 2005, at the age of 22, having never gone outside on her own, and despite believing she could be killed by Jackie, Katie decided to take the risk and made a break for it. How did you get out of the house? Mm -hmm. By the back door. And then just carrying lots of bags and things. And somebody saw me and said, do you need, do you need any help with your bags? So I said, no, but I've run away from home. So they said, so I said, what do I do? So they said, go to the police station. So I did. Tell me what happened when you went to the police station. So they persuaded me to let them call, call Bala and so then he came. Bala Krishnan reassured the police that all was well and took Katie back to the collective, where she remained in captivity for another eight years. A.B. did say that he, he likes to discuss things and query things, why things are done like this or that. that. But he says that if it's gone more than two or three times and he he resorts to, you know, slapping you or, you know, uh, on, on the face, you see, and 
something, sometimes other parts as well. So he, he, yes, it did happen. It did took place. So you were beaten? I was, yes. Was everybody beaten? I, I, I would have thought so, yes. These are outrageous allegations. Did you ever see happen. him hit anybody? No. Or humiliate anybody? No, I didn't. Or shout know. at anybody? He didn't do that to me, and yeah. No. You never saw anything like that? No, I didn't. Every aspect of life in the collective was neatly timetabled and logged in handwritten rotors, including Balakrishnan's baths and meals. But over time, the daily schedule evolved. Previously, only Balakrishnan and his wife had had access to the television. But now, all the comrades were allowed to watch selected programmes, including the six o'clock news. Would you discuss the news with him? Would you discuss world events with him? He would discuss with us. So he would talk and you would listen? Mm. Sounds like there wasn't much discussion, actually, because discussion means people exchanging ideas. That's right. But actually, he talked and you listened. That's right. So there's, there's no discussion, in fact. No. <laughs> in her late 20s, Katie, suffering from undiagnosed diabetes, began to rapidly lose weight. Terrified that a third member of the collective might die, Josie committed to memory a helpline number she had seen on the news. If you or someone you know is affected by forced marriage, call the BBC Action Line to hear recorded information. That's on 0800. Josie saved money in secret, smuggled a mobile phone into the flat, and in protracted discussions with the helpline, put together an escape plan. It was arranged that Katie and Josie would leave when Balakrishnan and Chanda were out shopping. So 11.15 sharp, we, we left, Josie and me, with our trolleys. I had absolutely no intention of leaving, you know. In fact, leaving the collective for me was really sort of like breaking my heart, really, but I I could see that she needed help, so, you know, she asked me to go with her, so I agreed to do it. I regret it very much now, but at that time, I didn't think that it will all blow up like this. As Katie and Josie made their way to freedom, Aisha chose to stay in the collective and was there when Balakrishnan and Chanda came back. He was denouncing Katie and Josie and saying that now they have joined the British fascist state and all those things. So, <coughs> time for lunch, so I said I'll cook lunch, so. We said we were just sitting down to have lunch when the police came. I told the police I'll come with them. But as I was coming out, I saw Chanda there and Bala there. I went and hugged them. Whatever I, you know, my misgivings, I hugged them anyway. Was that the last time you saw them, Maisha? Mm. And that's sad, that memory is very sad for you. Three. Is that very sad for you when you remember that? You look upset about that. Yeah, I'm upset. Because you've been with them for 40 years mm. or so. And they were like family, really, to you. Hmm.
In the course of the police investigation, all charges against Balakrishnan's wife Chanda were dropped, but new charges were brought against Balakrishnan himself. It emerged that as well as having had sex with Sean, Balakrishnan had sexually abused two other women over a period of years, both of whom had fled the collective by the early 90s. The first incident uh, with uh, Ms A was when she was called into Mr Balakrishnan's uh, bedroom. It had never happened before, she didn't know uh, why. A and uh, without warning, he, he kissed her. Mr Balakrishnan then began to summon Ms A to his bedroom. Uh, and where the sexual abuse that had begun with a kiss uh, then became more extreme in nature uh, uh, and became sexual abuse involving oral sex, forcing her to perform oral sex upon him and thereafter of, of sexual intercourse rape. The serious sexual abuse of that type continued and involved, in addition, uh, the defendant ordering her to lick his anus. She did as she was ordered, notwithstanding the, the distress that plainly she was uh, exhibiting. One of the women who testified in court said that when she tried to leave, this is woman A was how she was called in court, when she tried to leave, she said that Sean and O and Josie and you all held her down whilst Bala beat her. Is that true? God. I, I don't think I was there. I mean, I might have been there, but not holding her down like that for AB to beat her. Let me put it in another way. If, it, if that was true, Aisha, mm. would you feel able to tell me or would it be too shameful? I would tell you if I had done it, you know. I, I would also be able to tell you why I did it, but it was against me to do it. It was against my instinct to do it, you know. So does that mean she's lying? She might have... She might have thought I was there because all three of them, you know, you said Sean, Josie and O was holding her down and I was there. She might have thought that I was also putting her down. I doubt there's even three of them there. You don't need three people to, you know, there's maybe just Sean was holding her down. Because AB doesn't need anybody to be holding anybody for her, him to give you a smack on the face. And from the spell of... of the cult. Aisha is now 72 and is living in sheltered housing. Was any aspect of Bala's political experiment, was any aspect of that a success, would you say? I think uh, the issue about um, loving somebody who's not your own, I think that is a success. that every child has the right to live properly, to be loved, to be cared. Do you see there's a contradiction there, Aisha, because Paolo's gone to prison for abusing Katie. Yes, but, I mean, it, we, we now know how Kate, Katie felt about it, and in the future, we, we, we know not to do that. If you can't find a new way, then 
we carry on with the old, I suppose, but surely the old hasn't worked, so we still have to find what is better. Katie is doing her best to leave the indoctrination of her past behind. She's attending college and has recently moved out of supported accommodation into a flat of her own. When she first came, yeah, she was 30 years old in, in the way we measure mm. age, but she wasn't. Mm. She was much probably nearer to 10 or 11 or something like that. But she's, we've almost seen this journey through the ages, I think, and, and I think she's getting very close to her yeah. numerical age now. 